Well, um, Brother Steve intended to be here today uh, with us to lead tonight, but he, uh, last night, he texted, we, we were texting back and forth about uh, Donna's mom. And he said that uh, he really, as if they got longer, he felt apprehensive about coming. And uh, he said, do you think you could get something together? And I was like, yeah, I'll get something together. So that's why you'll get me tonight. But uh, we're going to be looking at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verses 8 through 12. So in the, in the book of 2 Samuel, in this particular chapter, uh, we're learning about David's mighty men. He had, uh, I think it was 37 men that were his personally trained uh, warriors. And there was three in particular that were his personal bodyguards. And that's who these got the, the guys that we're going to read about tonight. That's who they are. We're going to concentrate on the last one, but I want to read about all three of them just a little bit. Okay, so here we go in verse 8 of 2 Samuel 23. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joseph, Joseph Bashabeth, a Tachmanite, chief of the captains. He was called Adino the Esmite because of 800 slain by him at one time. And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo the Aholite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there to battle and the men of Israel had withdrawn. He arose and struck the Philistines until his hand was weary and clung to his sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to strip the slain. Now after him was Shalom, the son of Agi, a Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered into a tree where there was a plot of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. But he took his stand in the midst of the plot, defended it, struck the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory. <clears throat> so as I said, we're going to look mostly at Shama tonight. And uh, have any of you ever had lentil soup? Yes. Okay. If you haven't, basically lentils are peas. And uh, uh, Ron, Brother Ron was asking me, what kind of peas? And I said, well, I, I like black-eyed peas and crowder peas and cream peas and purple hole peas. I, I just don't like English peas. I like all the rest of them, but not the green ones. So, and even like there's one that's actually called a lentil. It's a little dry, a little green pea, and it's okay when it's mixed with the other ones. But uh, anyway, so we're looking at Shama tonight. And, and he's described for us as a man who took a stand against overwhelming odds. And he won a great victory by the help of the Lord. Um, and so we're going to look and see what we can learn from him tonight. The Bible tells us the, the Philistines were uh, attacking the people of God. And they gathered up in a, in a group. Like, I think they used the word troop. And... Uh, all the, when the people that were out there picking the lentils out of the field saw them, they ran away. Well, you know, everybody did except Shama. He stood in the field and decided that he, was, he wasn't going to run anymore. He was done running. He was going to make a stand. And that's what he did. So as, as, as I talk tonight, we'll just be thinking about... Uh, him staying in the pea patch and what that means for us. Um, there's three aspects of the story, and that's what number one, number two, and number three are on your on your list. And the first one was it was a time of great conflict. A time of great conflict. Uh, the Bible's pretty clear. It tells us that the Philistines were attacking the people of God. And that's that's definitely conflict right there, the war. And so it was definitely a time of conflict for the children of Israel. <clears throat> and what the Bible says about this is, A, when the enemy came. <clears throat> now, obviously the people were out in the pea patch picking the peas. So that means it was harvest time, right? And at harvest time, 
it's usually a pretty exciting time. You know, they're bringing in the harvest, they're getting it put in the barn, to put away. They usually have a good rest after the harvest. Sometimes they have festivals and enjoy the fruits of the harvest. And <clears throat> so they probably let their guard down. They weren't thinking about uh, being attacked during this time. You know, they, they probably didn't have their, their weapons around. Uh, they were probably just out there with their with their bags picking peas, you know, like we used to do when I was a kid. You know, you kind of walk out there and hit the bushes, make sure there's not any snakes in there and you pull the peas out. So I'm sure that's what they were doing too. They weren't ready. They were unprepared. The Philistines called them unprepared for battle. And so if we look at us, sometimes uh, we forget when things are going good and when we're unprepared, that's when Satan comes after us as well. Um, sometimes he'll come in the midst of, of a great victory or, or when we're celebrating a blessing that God has given us, that's when he attacks. Uh, so we always have to be ready. Uh, and most of the time when he comes after us, it's when good things are happening. You know, when uh, we're doing God's will, we're doing what we are supposed to be doing, that's when the Satan comes. <clears throat> a lot of times we, we find ourselves busy in the work of the church, even, and uh, doing what we need to be doing as a church family, and, and that's when Satan attacks. Um, you know, a lot, sometimes when we're caught unawares, it reminds me of the church at, of Ephesus that the, the talk about in Revelation, that they forgot. They were so busy about doing church doing, 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 that they forgot and they were not ready for when they were attacked. So we don't want them to be there. We don't want them to be so busy doing the good things that we don't see the enemy coming. Um, and God doesn't leave us unprepared. I mean, he tells us, he tells us in First Peter, he says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And then also he gives us an example of, in Nehemiah. That ne Nehemiah had a bunch of the Israelites had gone back to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And uh, they kept getting attacked. And the, the, the uh, city kings around them were mad because they were rebuilding the walls. And so they kept coming after the workers. So he met with them and said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Half of you are going to hold the weapons and the armor, and the other half are going to work, and you're going to swap out and take turns. And you always had your weapon there with you, and it kind of put a stop to those kings harassing them. Um, and we, we need to learn to work ourselves, where we got you know, one eye on the work and one eye looking out for the enemy, um, even while we're doing the good. Why? No letter B. Why the enemy came? The enemy came against Israel for two reasons. To inflict casualties and to destroy the crops. <clears throat> they knew if they could harass the people enough, they could wound them, uh, they could starve them, then they would be easily defeated and carried off in captivity as slaves. So the soldiers would march through the fields and they would stomp on the plants, make them destroy the plants, the gardens. Uh, they'd pull them up as they went through so that the people wouldn't have anything to eat. <clears throat> and let me tell you a secret. The devil doesn't really care that we're having church. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't mind it at all. He doesn't mind us when we sing. He doesn't mind us when we preach. He, he doesn't mind anything we do. But whenever we decide to get serious, that's when the attacks come. When we decide to get serious. When we pray, and pray fervently, as the scripture says, that's when he comes. When we reach out and start to witness to people and bring it brings glory to God, that's when the attacks come. 
when we praise the name of the Lord and mean it with all our heart and soul and mind, that's when the attacks come. When we're going to take a stand for the Lord, look out, trouble's on the way. As long as we're doing nothing, we're not a threat to Satan and his ideals. But when we get excited as people of God, that's when Satan comes. He wants to stomp in our pee bash. And we don't want him to. So what the enemy found, let her see what the enemy found. So when the enemy came, all the people were there. But they all ran away. They, the enemy found no opposition. They would march out in the fields and all the, the workers would just run off and leave them, leave them to stomp. Kind of sounds like church sometimes, doesn't it? Ouch. Sometimes when things get hard, we see people go. And... Uh, you know, everything's going good, the devil stirs things up a little bit, and then some people leave. Um, so what, what happens if 99% of the people leave? What if no one wants to take a stand? We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Could be why a lot of churches are falling apart. You know, and I'm not saying we are, but that could be why some churches are falling apart because no one is taking the stand. No one's got the courage to stand up and face the attack of Satan, face the attack of the enemy. You know, <clears throat> but somebody's got to say, by the grace of God, this pea patch is going to stand. I'm going to stand in my pea patch, and you're not going to destroy it. So. Oftentimes, the battles that we face are spiritual battles. Um, and sometimes God will use someone to, to stir the pot and create problems. But, you know, we have to realize there's things that are worth fighting for. And, uh, you know, we need to be a light for the glory of God. And we need to stand as His beacon here in our work. Wherever we go, we need to be light. So, you know, the Philistines found when they came to Israel right at this time that not only was it a time of great conflict, it was also a time of great courage. A time of great courage. Shama's resolve. The Bible tells us that Shama stood. He resolved in his heart that he would fight for that pea patch. He made up his mind he wouldn't run away. He wasn't going to run away today. Maybe he had in the past, but today he's taking a stand and fight, even if it cost him his life. Um, you know, he knew that the, the people of Israel, they, they need to eat. They had to have something to eat, right? And if he, they just kept, uh, you know, this is the second part, the Shabbos reason, why did he fight? He knew the people needed food. He knew they were would perish without it or would be captured by the Philistines into slavery again. So he had a lot of things to fight for. So what, what are some things that we fight for today? We fight for the church. We fight for the lost. We fight for the word of God. You know, we fight for... Uh, old-fashioned praying and preaching and praising. We fight for clean living. We fight for the reputation of the church. We fight for our families. We fight for our young people, our children, and our youth. All these things are important, and they all are literally worth dying for. Um, so, where's the shamans today? You know, who, who is being shama today? Is it you? Is it me? Is it Brother Steve? Uh, it ought to be all of us, honestly. 
Well, Shama's reward wasn't financial. It wasn't something that, uh, you know, that, like we got from Olympics or something like that. His reward was <laughs> he slew the enemies of God. And because he fought, the Lord got a victory. See, he, he didn't run away like everybody else. Um, if he had, he would have been branded as a coward, probably, and, and even would probably would have been defeated, but he didn't. So there's times when we got to take a stand, too. If we claim to love the things of God, then we ought to take a stand. We ought to take a stand for them and fight for what we believe in. Otherwise, it's kind of like uh, people that, that when we have an election and they don't go vote, but they allow the loudest ones to gripe about who got elected. Same thing, you know. If we don't stand up and fight for the things of, of God, we don't really have any room to complain, do we? If things aren't going like they ought to. So we need to be fighting the good faith. The good fight of faith. So there's a time of great conflict, a time of great courage, and a time of great conquest. That's number three, time of great conquest. The Lord defeated the enemy. In the last part of verse 12, look at that with me. The last part of verse 12, it says, But he took his stand in the midst of the plot, defended it, and struck the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory. Did it say that Shammah got the victory? No, it says the Lord did. The Lord got the victory. God gave Shama the ability to stand. He could stand on his own two feet. God gave him the power to fight. God gave him the skill to fight. And he gave Shama the victory over his enemies. Shammabat may have held the sword, but God won the battle. And it was the same with David when he walked into the valley against Goliath. You know, that's a lot of the people's favorite, one of the favorite stories of Goliath. And David. Or, you know, you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they got thrown in the fiery furnace. They stood their ground. They... they we're going to follow God no matter what. Or Daniel, you know, he continued to pray against the edict of the king about not bowing down to anyone except for him. And uh, David, continue, uh, Daniel continued to pray to God and worship God only. He got thrown in the lion's den. The lions didn't eat him. God, God held their mouth so all night. And he came out in victory. When, when men take a stand for God, He gives the victory. And when we face the battle, spiritual battles, we need to remember that those battles belong to the Lord. In 2 Chronicles 20, He tells us, Listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Uh, in Psalm 35, verse 1, Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. He's praying that the Lord will take the fight. Um, and then, talking about the David and Goliath story in 1 Samuel 17, David said to, Phil, to the Philistine, which was Goliath, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give you the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord is not delivered by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. 
we can't we can't forget the things that we learned from the word. God's real specific. The battle is his. He just needs us to be available. We just need to be available and listen to what he's teaching us, what he's used, asking us to do. And then just like Shama, we have to stand uh, and do what needs to be done. Um, you know, all that God requires of us is that we be faithful. Win or lose the battle, it doesn't matter. But be faithful to him, be faithful to the word, and everything's right. That's all he asks of us. Let her be. The Lord defended the ground. Did I skip A? The Lord defeated the enemy was A. B. The Lord defended the ground. Because God had that one man that was willing to stand, those fields were protected and the people were saved from starvation and slavery. Just that one guy. It, it doesn't say how many Philistines there were in this particular battle, but the two guys before him, the first one that they talked about said he slew 800. And the other one, the second one, he said he fought so much that the, the sword, the handle of the sword was stuck to his hand. He would grip it so long and so hard that during the battle that it had stuck in his hand. And he fought till he had no strength left. And we want a victory. So what happens if we don't take a stand? Satan's going to come in and he's going to take everything he can, right? He's going to take, every, take everything he can from, from the church. And if he takes away the Bible, what, what will the generations after us how will they learn? How will they grow? You know, the, the Bible is like bread. So what would they eat? Um, it takes away our desire to witness. Who's going to tell the good news? Who's going to tell people about salvation, about our wonderful Savior, and what he can do, what he does for us, what he has done, and the wonderful future that we know we have in heaven awaiting when it's our turn to, to pass on. What if he takes our will to pray? Who's going to be the one that stands in the gap and lifts up our, our nation, lifts up our world against Satan? If we don't fight, and we certainly lose the things that give us power and make us great for the glory of God, we don't fight today when people starve tomorrow. If the field's not protected now, those who follow won't have a harvest. So, you know, Satan, our enemy, is attacking the church just like the Philistines were attacking the Israelites today. And just like it was back then, we still see people fleeing from the battle. You know, they, they come and go. They're abandoning the harvest. They flee rather than fight for the truth and right. But my question for you is, where do you stand tonight? You know, we we need help in the nursery. We got we got babies coming that need somebody needs to be in there with them. Are you willing to help? We, we all say that we want to have children here. I, I, I've heard it billions of times, and I do too. But children require adult supervision. We can't just turn them loose. They, 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 they'd hurt each other, they'd hurt themselves, and they wouldn't learn what they need to learn about Christ about the Word, about God. If we don't have somebody to watch the kids, the parents aren't going to be here. So, where are you standing tonight? Are you willing to help out? 
That's just one area. Uh, we all want to grow, but as I look around here, I see a whole lot more gray hair and white hair and no hair <laughs> than I do, you know, except the few that dye your hair. You know. But you know what I'm saying? If we're going to get those folks here and keep them, then we got to step up. All of us have to step up and take a turn. You know, if, if seven or eight say all help, then you know you can rotate and, and just fill in their cage and not miss. I know you want to be in here, but those kids are a whole lot more important than what's going on in here. Honestly. You know, we, we need help in, the, in Sunday morning in the worship area. The, we've got, we're down to about three people that work the camera and the video stuff. And we had eight, so we need more. If you're interested, come talk to me about that. But there's things that we need to do. Um, I know it doesn't mean that y'all can do without the words on the wall and the, and the cameras and stuff, but... Young families coming in, they expect that nowadays. And if it's not there, then then they go, hmm, they're just old fashioned. I don't think that church fits. We don't want that. We're not old fashioned at all. So let me encourage you. Where's your pea patch? You know, we talked about the pea patch being the church, but it could be smaller than that. It could be a little part of it. You know, you may not have a great big pea patch. It might, your pea patch might be small. It might be your central class. It might be the nursery. It might be mowing the lawn. I don't know what your pea patch is, but are you willing to take a stand for it? Make sure that things get done that need to be done. Make sure that people are being taught the Word of God in, in a truthful way. From bed babies up to our oldest Sunday school class. Um, we could use another Sunday school worker, another teacher for, you know, I, I look at the age makeup of our Sunday school classes and I think in my class, I'm probably one of the youngest ones. And y'all know I just turned 55. And there's four more classes over me. But below me, there's only one class. That, and, and that class has got a widespread range. We really need one that kind of focuses on people from 20 to 40. Or maybe two classes there. Um, that, that would focus on those people. We got them on Sunday morning, they're here. So my, my encouragement, maybe God's calling you to be uh, that teacher, be that worker that we need, that, that would put in the time to get in those people's lives and get them in the Sunday school class. That would be a wonderful thing. But let me just encourage you to pray, see where God is leading you to stand. We all have to take a stand for Him. And it's in many, many, many different ways that we can do that. So let me encourage you to do that. Let's, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for giving us these men to look at the story of their lives and how, Father, they chose to follow you and uh, support their king. Father, I just pray that you use us as well, even here today, Father, I pray that you would let us find that pea patch for ourselves that you want us to stand in, take a stand, Father, and, and uh, keep it, keep it alive, Father, whether it's proclaiming the word, teaching in Sunday school, watching after the, the little ones, Father, whatever the case may be, I pray, Father, you would just fill us uh, with your spirit that we might hear directly from you what, what your call is to us. Father, we don't want to be the ones that forget to go and tell and proclaim Jesus Christ to the lost. 
Father, we don't want to drop the ball. We want to be the ones that we see the harvest. We see the new people coming to know Christ as Savior and Lord, Father. And we glorify your name for what's being done. Father, use us to do that. All of us can do that. Father, I just pray that uh, tonight, especially you'll be with Brother Steve and Donna. Uh, be with Donna's mom, Father. Just uh, give her peace and comfort. And Father, uh, we know that you know the moments, the seconds, the years that we will be here. And Father, we know that she's in your hands. And we just pray, Father, for a peaceful transition from this earth to your arms. For her and for her family as well. But Father, as we go tonight, we just pray that you will uh, keep us all mindful of you and the opportunities that you give us each and every day to tell people about our Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.